Welcome to another episode on the fossil record uh, with me, Benjamin Berger. This is a, a special episode as I've not been able to upload my um, weekly, normal weekly uh, videos since I've been quarantined because of the 2020 outbreak of the COVID-19 virus, which has made thousands of people sick around the world the last few weeks. Um, with schools all moving to online systems, I've been in the front lines of helping faculty and teachers migrate courses uh, fully online, as well as my own courses, which I typically teach with students in a classroom. Um, I've had to cancel uh, field trips, uh, scientific conferences, uh, readjust my whole life um, over the past few days. Um, the amazing thing is that this disruption was all caused by a tiny, I mean, a super tiny organism, which may not even be a living creature, but just a few strands of RNA that works really good at hijacking our cells and our lungs. So I thought I would uh, today take a look at viruses. What are they? Where did they come from? And how have they evolved? And most importantly, do they have a fossil record? So first, what is a virus? So almost all life on the planet is composed of cells, which are classified as either prokaryotic cells, that is bacteria, uh, those are cells without organelles, and eukaryotic cells, cells with organelles and a nucleus, which includes plants and fungus and algae and animals, including all the multicellular organisms. Viruses are not in either of these two groups, but something very bizarre uh, and very, very, very tiny. Viruses exist as particles, as vitrons that contain strands of DNA or RNA that make proteins, surrounded by a protein coat or capsid that protects the RNA or DNA from oxidation that is the reacting to oxygen that would break apart these molecules. They can also be encased in some lipids or other proteins. Now viruses can be shaped from helical forms to shapes like a D20 dice from Dungeons and Dragons or just be spherical in shape. Individual viruses are super tiny, about a hundred times smaller than bacteria. This makes finding uh, fossil viruses very challenging since they are so small, they can't be seen even under optical microscopes. You would need a very specialized scanning electron microscope to even see them. Likely, uh, viruses have been on the planet for billions of years, and their ecology suggests that they may be remnants of some of the earliest life forms on the planet. But the question is, are viruses living creatures? Well, not exactly. And that's because viruses don't grow or eat and they lack metabolism. And they also don't sexually reproduce. They can only replicate within a host cell. Viruses are everywhere, but especially in the oceans. Most viruses are pretty harmless but their origin is very fascinating and may explain why they can be so dangerous to us today. So there's three basic theories to their origin. The first theory holds that viruses originated from single-celled bacteria. Bacteria reproduce asexually they, by splitting their cells into two by making a copy of the DNA in their cell. And this works great to quickly reproduce when there's food and good conditions to grow, but does present a problem because asexual reproduction or clones of bacteria lack genetic diversity and they don't evolve or change quickly enough to adapt to a changing environment. 
one adaptation that bacteria developed was the ability to, to share genetic information between cells by replicating the DNA or RNA in their cell and sending the smaller package of information to other cells, which would incorporate this information into their own cell, actually putting it in their own DNA. This is like a, a network communication system. The problem with this system would be if a bacteria cell produced a package of DNA or RNA, then instead of being beneficial to the cell, would instead infect it, causing the cell to start replicating other packages of DNA or RNA encoded to infect other cells. Just like viruses on a computer network can cause issues by infecting a computer and sending emails to all your contacts in your email account with copies of the virus and thus spread quickly. True viruses in nature likely cause considerable damage among early colonies of bacteria on the planet. These packages of RNA and DNA would have originated from bacteria, but quickly spread as they replicated in cells that they infected. This theory of origin is called the escape hypothesis. Now, the second theory is that viruses have originated as the most primitive life form on the planet during a period of time in the Archean or even Hadean about 4 billion years ago when the atmosphere and the oceans lacked oxygen and the world was much warmer. The RNA world of this time period may have existed in oceans which were filled with self-replicating particles of RNA that would survive on the planet without oxygen, but rich in methane and other hydrocarbon molecules. So scientists have postulated that these ancient viruses would consist solely of single strands of RNA. Now, RNA is ribonucleic acid. It's a nucleic acid that in living cells acts as a messenger carrying instructions from DNA to synthesize proteins needed in the cell. Some viruses consist only of RNA. An RNA world would be a world where these ribonucleic acids would utilize hydrocarbon molecules to replicate new strands of RNA. RNA is an enzyme and can catalyze chemical reactions very quickly. So with the emergence of bacteria, these RNA strands of early viruses may have developed the ability to infect these early cells. So this uh, theory of origin is called the virus first hypothesis. The third theory is that viruses may be simply bacteria or maybe even eukaryotic cells that have retrograded into simpler life forms. Many viruses like those that cause smallpox are composed of DNA and are relatively speaking large in size. These DNA viruses could just be specialized bacteria that developed a parasitic lifestyle by utilizing other cells for replication, giving up the ability to grow and eat and developing a host parasite relationship with other organisms. This theory of origin is called the regressive hypothesis. Now, it's, it's actually likely that all three of these hypotheses are true with the various viruses originating from one of these processes. The influenza virus particles contain only RNA and are very, very tiny, about 80 nanometers in diameter. And if we don't really know how they originated on the planet, do we know at least something about how they evolve or change over time? Now, viruses change by mutations in the RNA, which can result during the replication process within, within the infected cells. So base pair changes can lead to changes in the genetic makeup of the strand of genetic material within the virus. One of the issues with viruses is that when these mutations in the genetic code allows a virus to infect a new host, so this is what is thought to have happened with many pandemics. 
in which a virus that infects one animal develops a mutation that allows it to infect another animal, such as us humans. So when an animal is infected with a virus, billions to millions of copies of the virus are made, and there can be little mistakes in the code of the virus that allows it to jump to a different host if the opportunity arises. It also means that with the numbers, the sheer numbers of replications of this virus uh, made in the host, that viruses have the propensity to change very quickly. And if these changes are advantageous that allow the virus to spread very fast within the host cells, then it can jump to other individuals, between individuals. So scientists have decoded the genetic material within these viruses and developed a phylogeny that's based on these mutation events, giving a evolutionary tree that helps map out the spread of the virus from one host to another host. So as a host, humans can also host this mutation event within their own cells, such that a pandemic can stem from a single individual unknowingly. Virologists are studying the origin of this particular strain of the influenza virus uh, called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2, which has provincially been called the 2019 novel coronavirus, or COVID-19, a single-strand RNA virus. Phylogenetic study of the virus suggests a close relationship to viruses that also infect bats and pangolins. Pangolins may have been the cause of this virus if they've been imported into China and present in the market where this virus was thought to have originated from. The COVID-19 virus infects lung tissue, that is individual cells in the lungs of mammals which are more sensitive to these viruses because of the importance they serve in the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide and respiration when we breathe. Hence the virus can damage these cells and cause rapid onset of health issues related to respiration. Viruses spread from person to person by coughs or particles that get breathed in. Each time a virus infects a person, the virus also change, changes with uh, further mutations, such that viruses may become more benign over time, as those viruses that jump from person to person uh, may be more likely if it did not make that person sick enough to stay home. Now, the best protection for infection uh, from ex uh, spreading is to quarantine or to isolate or social distancing. Now, I'm not a virologist or infectious disease expert, but I'm a paleontologist. So the question that I want to ask is, has anyone found a fossil virus? Yes, they have. A study from 2005 by George and Roberta Banar, published in the Journal of Invertebrate Pathology, uh, found evidence of fossil viruses. They found a fossil midget preserved in amber that exhibited an infection of the cyptovirus. This evidence of a fossil virus comes from the 99 million year old Burmese amber from the Cretaceous of Asia. This Burmese amber also recently preserved a teeny tiny little lizard that was actually published in the journal Nature as a possible dinosaur or bird, um, but has recently been uh, uh, interpreted as actually being a little teeny lizard. Um, now these viruses are so tiny, they can't be actually directly observed in the amber. Instead, the pathology exhibited in the fossil midget, uh, the fossil insect, uh, suggests the presence of the virus. Hence, fossil evidence of viral infections uh, extends back to the age of dinosaurs. But what about earlier in Earth's history? Well, in 2010, James Ladner and Kenneth Stedman did a really cool experiment published in Astrobiology to see if they could fossilize a virus in silica such as would be likely in conditions in hydrothermal springs. 
they were successful in fossilizing a modern virus in this silicified uh, rock, suggesting that viruses could be found in chert or silica veins uh, from early in Earth's history. Hence, there is the possibility that viruses could be found in the future from very early in Earth's history, which would support their long presence on Earth today. It also suggests that viruses, if present on other planets, could also be preserved in those rocks on other planets. Um, these fossil viruses would ha can be detected in silica by using energy dispersed X-ray spectrometry, um, looking for the element phosphorus, which is an element found in RNA and DNA. And phosphorus is actually very rare in silica. Um, so tests could be developed in the future to be able to detect phosphorus in silica rocks, as well as carbon isotopes to detect fossil viruses that cannot be seen underneath a microscope. So um, I hope that this video reaches you while you are safe and healthy. I'm going to try to upload uh, more videos in the coming weeks despite all the quarantines across the world because I think it's really nice to have some educational videos to watch during this time of uncertainty. Um, I also want to thank my Patreons for their support. I'm hopefully going to be back to my normal schedule of doing videos in the near future. I have some really interesting videos planned on fossils and dinosaurs and geology. And now that the snow is just nearly starting to melt away, I'm looking forward to getting back in the field with some additional videos to, to share with you guys. I hope the future holds a healthy outcome for you and your entire family. Thanks for watching.